So uh, welcome. Uh, I'm going to start with an acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut and the Innu of Nintasinen and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So thanks everyone for coming. I'm Mike Morrow. I'm the president of the St. John Center of the RESC. And um, we're cognizant of the forecast, although the forecast says that it's supposed to be uh, um, snow at times heavy right now and there's none but um what we're going to do is uh try and go through the meeting fairly quickly um our talk is going to be by jim johnson and he's offshore so he's going to be doing it uh remotely and uh after that i'm going to do the observation reports fairly quickly um we're going to skip over the um sky this month but it'll be posted and uh, then uh, let me just move that up out of the way. Um, and then we're, uh, if we have refreshments at the end, they'll be fairly abbreviated refreshments. So um, next month, uh, our speaker is going to be Dr. Ivan Booth from the math department, but a graduate of the physics department. And he's going to talk about why galaxies beyond a certain distance um the galaxies that are farther away actually look bigger it's a relativistic effect so ivan's the right one to tell us about that <coughs> for any visitors and i'm not sure we have any visitors um i've listed some of the benefits of uh joining the RESC, and for locally one of the big benefits is that you get access to our um chat room or our chat uh, site uh, for shared observations and mentoring and discussion, and, and that's um, uh, really valuable. And if you haven't joined that already, you can contact Randy at info at stjohnsresc.ca, and he'll uh, hook you up with that. There are bulletins and a weekly bulletin, a, a weekly newsletter and a monthly bulletin. And if you're getting the monthly bulletin, you would have seen that there have been changes in the national office staff. I'd encourage you to have a look at that. We did talk about that a little bit at the beginning of the last meeting. Um, and um, so that's uh, sort of interesting to know about. So with that, I'm going to uh, invite Jim Johnson to share his screen and I'm gonna stop sharing mine. And um, he's now started sharing, so go ahead and... Uh, let me see if I can. I guess I better unmute myself. Yeah, you should unmute and uh, okay. So uh, Jim, why don't you take it away? All right, so can everyone hear me? I can. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, so first off, apologies if you hear any announcements or anything in the background. Like Mike said, I'm at work. Uh, I came out this morning, been up since 4.30. Um, so offshore at the moment, um, I got my little picture in the background. If, if I didn't have that there, you'd see my uh, fancy clinic setup that we have out here on Iberia. So um, hopefully there'll be no alarms or any emergencies or anything that I got called away for. Um, if I do, I apologize. Uh, I am the only healthcare provider out here. So understandable, if something does come up, I'll have to, uh, to go. With that said, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll cover our topic. And um, just as a little caveat, uh, by no means am I an expert in this field. Uh, most of the stuff I'll be talking about this evening, I learned through um, either experience uh, firsthand or things that I have read online uh, through other people's experiences and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so the topic for this evening is uh, narrow band filters. Um, so first thing, I'm uh, just going to do a quick overview. I'm going to just briefly touch on uh, dedicated astro cams or versus uh, DSLR cameras. Uh, we'll then look at uh, mono versus uh, one-shot color cameras, the advantages and disadvantages, that sort of thing. Uh, then we'll go on to cover the narrow band versus uh, wide band uh, imaging briefly. 
And then we'll get into the main topic of narrowband filters uh, with main focus on the three most popular types uh, being uh, hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, and sulfur two. And then we'll go on to discuss uh, some narrowband filter options for one shot color as well. So um, um, I did start uh, way back, uh, I shouldn't say way back, it hasn't been that, hasn't been that long. Um, I've only been doing probably astrophotography for the last five or six years now. And I think my, la my first and only talk uh, with, the, uh, with the group was way back in 2018, I think, when uh, I first joined. Um, and I basically just kind of gave a bit of background as to uh, how I started out in astrophotography and where I was at that point. Um, so I did start out with a DSLR at the time and uh, quickly uh, moved over to uh, dedicated uh, astronomy cameras. Uh, some of the main uh, advantages uh, of a dedicated astronomy camera over a DSLR, for example, um, are things like uh, cooling. So um, you're able to actively cool uh, the sensor in a dedicated astronomy camera. Um, so you're able to control the temperature um, and thus the amount of noise um, that are in your images. Um, and you're also able to uh, take uh, your dark frames and your um, flats, if you do take those at uh, a specific temperature, um, to match your uh, to match your light frames. Um, it's a little more difficult when you're using a DSLR because you're kind of um, bound by the uh, the environmental temperature at the time uh, to dictate the uh, the temperature that the sensor is uh, shooting at. Another advantage to using a dedicated astronomy camera is the availability of software and drivers. Um, I know when I first started using my DSLR for photography, uh, one of the uh, main disadvantages was the availability of uh, software. Um, there was only a couple of different software packages on the go at the time. Uh, the main one being um, Backyard EOS, uh, which was available from old telescope. Um, with a dedicated astronomy camera, there is... Uh, numerous uh, different um, software suites that uh, that can be utilized. Also drivers um, for astronomy or dedicated astronomy cameras tend to be, again, more um, available uh, versus uh, trying to find uh, drivers for a DSLR that work with some of the uh, software packages that are uh, mainly focused towards the dedicated astronomy cameras. Uh, the other advantage is power. Um, with the DSLR, you are kind of limited to batteries to a certain extent. Uh, there are some uh, uh, third-party options available where you can pop in a, a battery um, type that uh, plugs into an external power source. Uh, the only issue with those is that they usually work on a different voltage than what's usually readily available, so either 12 volt or 5 volt. Um, I think a DSLR is about 7, seven volts and change, so it is a little, little different voltage. So um, power is a bigger advantage for the, uh, for the dedicated camera. Uh, another advantage for the dedicated astronomy camera is most of them, uh, the majority of them lack a, an IR cut filter. Um, so with the DSLR, uh, those are right on the sensor. Uh, and the only way to, uh, to get rid of those is to, to modify. And even, uh, even with those gone, you get a lot of uh, extra um, reds and stuff in your, in your images. Now, some dedicated astronomy cameras, especially those for uh, planetary imaging, do have uh, an IR cut filter in. Uh, some more advantages of a dedicated astronomy camera. Uh, you have a choice of mono versus a one-shot color. So you can either uh, choose your sensor being uh, just basically a, mono a monochrome sensor, or you can choose uh, like a one-shot color, and then you don't have, you can avoid the extra expense of uh, filters and all the ex extra stuff that comes with the mono cam that we'll discuss in a few minutes. Uh, there are also uh, specialized cameras, uh, astronomy cameras that uh, are used specifically for planetary imaging. Um, the one advantage of using those over a DSLR is that they have the ability to capture at a higher frame rates than the DSLR is capable of. So having just uh, Bad mouth for the DSLR cameras, uh, they're not all bad. A um, couple of advantages is they're multi-use. So uh, they are available for uh, terrestrial and um, astrophotography. Uh, oddly enough, even after they're modified, you can continue to use your modified camera for terrestrial 
uh, photography. Um, you just need to uh, just sometimes go in and adjust the white balance settings. And there's even uh, specific clip-in filters that you can get to uh, to go in your modified DSLR uh, that will allow you to use them for uh, terrestrial photography still. Uh, they're readily available. Uh, again, like I said, they're easily, or they are modifiable. And uh, there are lots of uh, available tutorials online as to how to modify your camera yourself. So you don't need to go through the, uh, the added expense of sending it away to uh, to a professional to get it modified. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive uh, compared to a dedicated uh, astrophotography camera. And generally the sensors in a DSLR uh, tend to be uh, larger than uh, what's available in some of the, uh, the less expensive um, dedicated astro cameras. And last but not least, uh, you are able to use uh, clip-in filters for the uh, DSLRs uh, as well. So they can be used for um, astrophotography. One advantage of, so now I'm just going to cover some of the advantages and disadvantages of monochrome versus a one-shot color. So advantages of a monochrome versus a one-shot color, um, basically every pixel in a monochrome camera uh, will see the full spectrum of light that the sensor is capable of responding to. Uh, i.e. there's no Bayer filter over the fil over the uh, sensor in a, in a one-shot color camera. Uh, so this ultimately results in the result uh, in a more detailed image. So what is a Bayer filter, you may ask? So um, a Bayer filter is a color filter array, um, basically that they put over the sensor in a one-shot color camera. Um, it's used in most single, single chip uh, digital imaging sensors. Um, so cameras like digital cameras, camcorders, scanners. Um, and what happens is they allow you to create a color image with, uh, with the sensor. So basically uh, you get a sensor that has a filter pattern. Um, usually half the pattern is green, uh, one quarter is red and one quarter is blue. Um, hence it's called uh, a uh, RGGB, I think, is the, probably the most common that I have seen. Uh, you can also get uh, blue, red, red, green, or red, green, red, green, or green, red, blue, green. Uh, and this was uh, invented by a gentleman named Bruce Bayer, hence the name Bayer Filter. And he worked for Kodak. Uh, some disadvantages of a monochrome versus a one-shot color camera. Uh, generally with the mono camera, um, there's a lot more expense involved. So you have to go out and you have to buy additional uh, items like uh, filters uh, and filter wheels, um, either uh, automatic filter wheels or uh, manual filter wheels. Uh, they can be more time consuming. Um, and when I say time consuming, I mean uh, in the fact that you have to shoot uh, multiple different uh, subs. So you have to shoot subs for the red channel. You have to shoot subs for the green channel. You have to shoot subs for the blue channel. And you have to, you, I guess you don't have to, but uh, most people generally shoot uh, subs through a luminance uh, type filter. So basically you're collecting all the wavelengths of light at once. Uh, the only issue that I have encountered with this in the past is, and especially with the weather we experienced in Newfoundland, is that you know you may be halfway through the night you may have all your red in, or your red subs you may have all your green subs taken and then it clouds over and you're left with no blue subs or you're left with no luminous subs so if you had a one shot color you're kind of collecting all your red green and blue at the same time so it's it's it can be more advantageous to use a one shot color um, versus the mono in that instance. Uh, with a one-shot color, or sorry, with a mono camera, you generally you need to take longer exposures, um, and especially when you're uh, capturing narrowband imaging. Um, obviously, if you're taking all these extra subframes, uh, you're going to need more storage uh, on your computer to store all this extra raw data. And then in post-processing, or even in pre-processing, there is a lot of additional uh, work that uh, is involved because you have to process your red uh, channel, your green channel, your blue channel, and then you have to combine them all into a single image.
So a couple, couple of different imaging types. Sorry, I almost spilled my water bottle over my printer. Um, there's wide bands. Um, so this uh, picture of the uh, Orion Nebula. Can you guys see my cursor? Yes. 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 Okay. So this uh, uh, image of the uh, Orion Nebula was taken with a, uh, a one-shot color camera that I have. Uh, the narrow bands, uh, there's narrow band imaging. Um, so this is a uh, close-up of the uh, Cygnus wall uh, that was captured in narrow band using the Hubble palette. And there's also uh, photometry, and I'm sure there's other different types of imaging as well. Um, so this is the light curve that was uh, taken from the project that I did a couple years ago with the Department of National Defense with the uh, Intelsat 1002. Um, so wide band imaging. So basically, you're looking at the uh, the entire visible spectrum. Um, so the vis the typical human eye can detect anywhere from uh, 380 to 700 nanometers. Uh, so going from the longest to the shortest wavelength, you got red, orange, yellow, blue, green, and you got violet. So red being the longest and violet being the shortest wavelengths. Um, so what is wide band imaging? So basically you're utilizing color filters uh, with a wide band pass to capture color data um, with a mono camera. Um, so in this picture here, there's just an example of a couple of astrometric uh, red, green, and blue filters. Uh, and they capture a wide band of each, uh, each color. Uh, in the case of a one-shot color, uh, generally no filter is required due to the uh, built-in Bayer filter that we talked about. Um, a lot of people do utilize, uh, however, light pollution filters um, to cut out unwanted uh, wavelengths of, of light in the various parts of the spectrum. Uh, the two most common of those being uh, sodium uh, and mercury um, vapor lamps. So for sodium, uh, you're looking at uh, blocking out uh, wavelengths in the 589, 589.6, 615.4, and 616.1 nanometer wavelengths. And with the uh, mercury vapor lamps, uh, you're looking at blocking 435.8, fourth, sorry, 546.1, uh, 577, and 578.1. Um, and besides the uh, the light pollution filters, you can also use narrow band filters uh, specific for one-shot color cameras. So I just got a couple of examples of uh, a couple of different wide uh, band pass light pollution filters. Uh, this one's from Optolong. Uh, it's the moon and sky glow, sky glow filter. Um, and it generally runs anywhere from about $70 Canadian on a couple of uh, local websites, uh, Canadian websites. And basically, this one blocks out, uh, like I said, the uh, the sodium and the uh, the mercury vapor uh, channels, and basically allows in the rest of the visible spectrum of light there. Another popular one is uh, Optolong uh, CLS CCD uh, filter, and again, this one uh, blocks major emission lines uh, nebula. Or sorry, it allows major emission lines and nebula to come through. So your hydrogen uh, beta, your O3, uh, your hydrogen alpha, and it uh, it blocks the uh, major emission lines of artificial light pollution. And this one's a little more expensive. It's uh, runs usually generally at about two hundred nineteen dollars Canadian. Uh, so that's wide band. So narrow band imaging. So simply put. Uh, narrow banding Im imaging, uh, it utilizes different filters that only allow a very narrow wavelength of light to pass um, while basically filtering all others out. So generally narrow band filters, uh, they can be anywhere in the range from uh, three to about 12 nanometers. Uh, so just keep in mind that in one millimeter, there's one million nanometers. So you're talking about very, 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 very small tolerances. Uh, so the three most common narrowband filters, like I mentioned, are hydrogen alpha, uh, oxygen three, and sulfur two. Uh, there's a couple other available that uh, you can get as well. You can get hydrogen beta, and you can also get uh, sodium. Yes. Uh, so what do we mean when we're talking about you know, hydrogen, oxygen, all this stuff? And again, I'm no uh, 
physicist or chemist. So um, um, this is just very generalized. Uh, so basically what these refer to is the atom that, the, that emits the photon of light. So in the picture up here, we're using the hydrogen atom as an example. And again, this is very generalized. Um, but the ground state of an electron or the energy level it normally occupies is the state of the lowest energy for that electron. So this would be the ground state here. You got your, your proton and your electron and hydrogen atom. Um, when this atom gets excited, uh, the electron can jump up to a, 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 a more excited state or a different shell. Um, and then we call it an excited state. Um, however, electrons usually don't stay in their excited states for very long. Uh, they, soon, they soon return to their ground uh, states. And when that happens, they emit the photon um, with the same energy as of the one that was absorbed. So basically when that happens, uh, the light that we capture using narrowband filters is that photon uh, from the hydrogen atom or the oxygen atom or the sulfur atom. So this little graphic here just demonstrates the uh, the difference in wavelengths that are captured with uh, the diff couple of different filters. So on the left are narrow band type filters. So you have your hydrogen beta, which is generally in the, uh, the blue spectrum. Um, your oxygen three, which is kind of borderlines the blue and the green um, wavelength. Uh, your hydrogen alpha and your sulfur two, which are up in the red uh, portion of the spectrum. So what are some advantages of narrowband imaging versus wideband imaging? Um, firstly, uh, it's most effective in high light pollution areas. So um, it's pretty effective in like cityscapes, those sorts of areas. Um, a lot of the pictures you see online, uh, amazing shots of people taking wideband images from like portal uh, seven, eight skies um, in uh, fairly light polluted uh, centers. Another advantage uh, is that the moon phase is not an issue um, generally. And I say generally because uh, it can uh, affect uh, narrowband imaging, especially when you're shooting oxygen three. Um, so generally what I tend to do if I'm shooting narrowband during a, a, a partial full moon or um, a full moon is I, I do try to still try to stand, tend to stay away from shooting at objects that are uh, in the general vicinity of the moon. And if, for example, if you have a half moon uh, on the evening that you're shooting, I'll probably tend to shoot my oxygen three while the moon is still below the horizon and then shoot my hydrogen, my sulfur data once the moon has risen. Uh, another advantage of uh, using uh, wide band versus narrow band imaging is that you can, you can get away with using uh, cheaper uh, achromatic refractors. Um, these couple of images over here, um, there's a gentleman that I follow you on Astrobin. Um, and these, these two images right here are actually taken with the uh, Explore Scientific AR-152, uh, uh, which is a $1,300 achromatic 152 millimeter refractor. Um, so if you compare that to the cost of a uh, 165 millimeter uh, APO, which is about $16,000. So you can get away with a cheaper telescope. Um, obviously, if you're shooting narrow band, you don't have to worry about, say, uh, uh, chromatic aberration. Uh, a couple other advantages to narrow band imaging. Uh, images are also scientifically interesting, um, so they can tell you a lot about what's going on inside a nebula. And uh, you can use different color palettes uh, in post-processing to give your images different, uh, different looks. So the, uh, the four images on the screen, they were all captured and process with the exact same data. So you can kind of um, adjust to taste. Any questions so far? Really Nothing hurt. So some advantage, some disadvantages, sorry, of narrowband image. Um, generally, uh, it can't be used uh, to image galaxies or reflection nebula. Um, there is a caveat there, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, only emission nebula, planetary nebula, and supernova remnants can be captured with narrowband imaging. Um, you can, however, use narrowband imaging, uh, specifically uh, hydrogen alpha imaging, uh, to enhance galaxy, galaxy images. So as an example, uh, this is M33, I believe. 
Um, so the top image here is just a regular RGB uh, or LRGB image. And the bottom one here is the same data set, except I used uh, some HA data in there to highlight the, uh, the different areas in the image or in the galaxy, the, uh, uh, some of the nebular regions in the galaxy. Are you guys able to see that clearly? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another disadvantage uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, generally narrowband images or narrowband filters, sorry, uh, can be fairly expensive. And obviously, if you're going to be getting into a couple of different, or if you're going to get into the three common ones, then you have to buy three separate filters. And generally, the narrower the band pass, the more expensive the filter gets. So, uh, like we said, the three most common are hydrogen alpha, uh, oxygen three, and sulfur two. So hydrogen alpha, generally, uh, you're looking at a wavelength of 656.3 nanometers. Oxygen-3 is about 500.7 nanometers, and sulfur-2 is 672.4 nanometers. Like I said, there are the uh, hydrogen beta uh, and sodium, um, which is 486.1 and 658.4. Uh, the three images on the right here are the different data sets for the different filters. Um, not every object that you're going to image is going to have either uh, hydrogen, oxygen, or sulfur data uh, in, your, in your image set. Uh, this is the Rosette Nebula, and it does have data from all three um, of the common uh, narrow bands that you can capture. So the top one here is hydrogen, uh, the middle one is the oxygen data, and then the bottom one is sulfur. If you were imaging an object like the Veil Nebula, um, there is no sulfur data in the Veil Nebula whatsoever. Uh, it's all hydrogen and oxygen. So a um, couple of different types of narrowband filters. Um, these are the ones that I started out with. These are these EWO um, seven nanometer band pass uh, uh, filters. And of course, all my gear was uh, one and a quarter inch. And since I had actually bought mine, they had come out with a, a newer updated version. And this is, uh, these are the newer ones. Um, the advantages of, of the newer versus the older ones were supposedly they, uh, they gave less halos around uh, very bright stars. So as you can see, and this is a picture I took directly from the ZWO website. Um, they, they have a shot of the old HA filter and the new HA filter. And uh, this is all the pack. Uh, it's the left star in the belt of Orion. And as you can see, the, uh, the halo is significantly less in the, the newer HA filters than the older ones. And this is this is my experience with these uh, ZWO filters when I first had them. Is that if you were to image any any object that was near a bright star, so this the uh, the jellyfish nebula is another one that comes to mind, um, had a very bright star in the vicinity, you'd get these awful halos. And it wasn't just the hydrogen; it was the oxygen as well that would do it. Uh, so these are seven nanometer bandpass filters. Um, like I said, they can be expensive. Uh, they run $129 US uh, for the individual or a set of three for $369. And that's just for the one and a quarter inch filters. Uh, if you're using two inch or larger, obviously they get more expensive. Uh, and again, um, different brand name. Um, and with the rest of these, I'm just going to be using the hydrogen alpha as the examples. Uh, so these are the filters that I use myself personally. These are astronomic filters, so I have a full set of these. Um, these are six nanometer bandpass. And uh, the only website I could find these on at the present time was uh, the uh, astronomic site itself, which is based over in the UK. So the price is in euros. So it's about 199 euros per filter. Uh, this is a couple examples of uh, two images that I took personally with the uh, when I first got the new astronomic uh, filters versus the ZWO, my old filters. Um, and again, here is the uh, on attack with the uh, ZWO filters. And you can see the, the nice bright halo around it versus the uh, astronomic um, filters that I uh, that I was using after. Are they the same length uh, of time on those? Yep, yep, exact same exposure and everything. Everything was the same, the only difference was the filter. Okay. 
difference. Yep. Now, having said that, like I said, these were the old CWO filters. Uh, I I have no experience with the newer ones. Um, these ones back here that they advertise, and these are the only ones they sell now. So, um, your your mileage may vary. But again, the price one hundred twenty nine versus two hundred euro. So, uh, I'm I'm assuming that's probably over two hundred Canadian. So, uh. Astrodon filters, uh, which is no longer Astrodon. They're a different company now. Um, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. If anyone knows it, please shout it out. Um, a couple of years ago, I did acquire an Astrodon uh, HA filter um, as well. And the one that I have is the 5 nanometer bandpass. Um, there is a 3 nanometer bandpass available as well. Um, and these are, at the time, were the cream of the crop uh, filters for narrowband imaging. Um, single filter for those is uh, running about $418 US. That's for the uh, three, one and a quarter inch filters. Uh, the two inch and larger, obviously, are a lot more expensive. But again, there's a couple of images here of uh, that I took with these filters. And as you can see, this is the Flame Nebula, and here's all the tacker right here in the, in the bottom corner. Um, so it does a very good job of taming um, really bright stars. The only disadvantages I find with this filter is you need to take very, very long exposures. Um, I think uh, these are all five minute exposure subs that were combined for these images. Uh, there are narrowband filters available for one shot color cameras as well. Um, either specific cameras for astrophotography or there are clip on or clip and filters available as well for um, DSLRs. Uh, a couple of the most popular ones, uh, these are two different uh, filters from the same company. So these are both Optolong. Uh, this is the L Enhanced and the L Extreme filter. Uh, the L Enhanced is a tri-band filter, uh, covers the hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, and oxygen three uh, bands. Um, these are a little wider in their narrow, in their band pass. So it's uh, 10 nanometers on the HA and 24 nanometers on the oxygen and the hydrogen beta. And that one runs for uh, 249 Canadian. Uh, and again, that's a 1.25 inch filter, uh, available in larger sizes, but again, the price will be more expensive. Uh, the uh, L-Extreme filter is a little more narrow band. It's uh, seven nanometers in hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. And as a result, it's gonna be a little more expensive. Another popular one that uh, made the rounds or came out a couple of years ago is uh, the one from Radian, uh, the Triad Ultra Narrowband Filter. Uh, this one covers four bands, actually. It covers hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, oxygen three, and sulfur two. Uh, and their band passes are as per on the table there on the bottom. So five nanometers for hydrogen beta, four nanometers for oxygen three, four for ox hydrogen alpha, and four for sulfur. Um, Unfortunately, this is very expensive. Uh, runs four hundred or seven hundred and eighty dollars US for the uh, one and a quarter inch uh, variant. But I have seen lots of uh, lots of really good pictures online. People using these with their one shot color cameras and getting phenomenal images. Uh, if you're going to use one shot color uh, filter for narrow band or sorry, a filter for narrowband with a one-shot color camera, there are some advantages. Uh, the biggest one being time saving. Um, so again, goes back to what I was talking about with wideband imaging, when you're, you have to capture your, your three different channels when you're using a mono camera. Um, when you're using a, a, a narrowband filter for a one-shot camera, you're basically capturing all three narrowband channels uh, at the same time. Um, another advantage is you can process your data um, in a couple different ways. So you can either take the raw damn raw sorry the raw data that your camera your camera has captured and process it so that will give you an image something like the one on the top here, or you can uh, in your post processing you can uh, take your image and you can split the channels uh, so you can extract your red channel your green channel and your blue channel from the image, and then you can assign either the red channel to hydrogen alpha or sulfur two. I've seen it done both ways. Um, the green channel to sulfur two or hydrogen alpha, 
and the blue channel to oxygen three. And then you can process it uh, like you would with uh, if you were using a mono camera and have sh and shot the three different uh, uh, the three different narrowbands separately, and you can produce uh, SHO or Hubble palette images. So these two images here were done with the same data set. And I just happened to grab these off uh, the internet off of this website here, just as an example. So that's uh, that's the quick and dirty. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, let's, let's thank Jim first. And, uh, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'm sure there are some questions. I'm going to change to the, yeah. Oh, okay. You've stopped sharing. That's good then. Um, I'm still going to do a gallery so we can, so people can put up their hand uh, using the, uh, reactions at the bottom of the screen or just in the room waving. Uh, so that, that was a very interesting talk, Jim. A lot of information there. Uh, a lot of aspirational stuff for some of us. Um, so questions from the room or questions from online? Uh, Chris? Yep. Did, did you have a question or you? Uh, no, uh, no questions, Jim. Uh, well done. Uh, big topic. <laughs> <Thank you. Yeah. laughs> um, it is very big topic. Um, I kind of when when you asked me to do a talk on filters for imaging, um, you kind of have to narrow it down from the bump um, because it's such a broad topic, and you can talk about like you could talk for hours. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I like where you had a slide that had the uh, nitrogen lines. Um, and I just pointed out briefly that it's nitrogen, not sodium. Sodium is oh, NA. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's that fine. Uh, I, I think there is actually some interest in the nitrogen lines. These emission lines are from nitrogen with a single electron missing. So, so most of these are from ions, except for hydrogen. And um, the, the, the narrow nitrogen lines, there's two of them, and they, they straddle the hydrogen line. They're right next to it. And most filters actually let the nitrogen lines through with the hydrogen. But if you get really narrow band filters, and I think the threes will do it, you can actually uh, separate out the hydrogen and then you can subtract it from an image taken with a wide hydrogen filter that gets the nitrogen and you're left with nitrogen. I think somebody makes a filter for the nitrogen by itself. But you know, to the human eye, it's red. It's the same red yeah. as hydrogen. Is that, is that hydrogen alpha you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, yeah, hydrogen alpha. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and and uh, yeah. So the O3 is oxygen with two electrons missing. Uh, the only other thing I'll say is is uh, you mentioned um, the different lines show you different parts of nebulae, and uh, hydrogen is basically going to be there throughout, but the uh, oxygen with two electrons missing is going to be close to the star that powers the nebula because that's where the most energy is, and. Um, takes more energy to, to knock those two electrons off and uh, not in the outer parts. So, so it's a, you, you, you can, by looking at different li uh, lines, different colors, and you can isolate those with the narrow band filters, you can study different parts of the nebula inside or outside. And the sulfur two uh, samples, I think the outside edge and so on. So uh, it's, it's uh, when you can dissect the light of a nebula this way, um, then you can play with the, the, the data. You, you've taken it separately and then you can do, you can make pretty pictures and then the scientists can study various things and it's all, it's all wonderful. It's expensive, but it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Robert. Yeah, I was gonna um, ask uh, about uh, uh, filters for uh, galaxies. Uh, you're pretty limited to just wide band, I believe. I don't think you can get away with any narrow band uh, if you're talking about, you know, imaging of a, of a galaxy. Doesn't seem to be as much available for, you know, for that object. Okay, did you get that, Jim? No. Yep, well, like I said, in the, in the talk, you can use a narrow band, um, specifically uh, HA data, to uh, enhance your galaxy imaging. Um, like for the, uh, there's a couple of good examples online. If you look for different pictures of the Andromeda galaxy, for example, with uh, 
just a simple LRGB versus HALRGB. It's got the it's got the uh, the hydrogen data in there as well. You can see you can see the different areas of nebulosity within the uh, Andromeda galaxy, for example. Would you would you add that uh, in at the at stacking, or does that have to be done with a more sophisticated program? Well, you'd uh, you capture the HA data separately, and then you'd add it in post processing. So does that mean post processing? Do you mean uh, stacking, or again, does that have to come down to a more sophisticated uh, software? Uh, well, you, you'd you'd stack your HA data as an image in its in and of itself. And then you would add that image to your LRGB image um, in, a, in a program like PixInsight or, or I don't know if there's any other um, post-processing software that can do that. I'm sure there is. I'm sure you can add it with Photoshop even. Yeah. So it would work too. So that, like for instance, I can take H alpha and uh, uh, you know separate from uh, let's say a uh, Light pollution filter for you know any given galaxy, and uh, I could manage to uh, have to st to stack the, them together, but that but that wouldn't be enough or it wouldn't be sufficient to to do the job. No, we wouldn't be able to capture broadband and narrowband simultaneously. No, no, do it separately, certainly. Yep. I guess I could try it and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Can't hurt. <laughs> You'll just get the narrow band, Robert. <laughs> yeah, but I got an OSC camera, so. <laughs> okay, Jim's got a question. Uh, uh, the other Jim? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jim, for uh, a, a very interesting uh, talk on uh, narrow band filters. Uh, can you give us some um, recommendations or things to think about uh, regarding filter wheels because we don't we're not talking about the, uh, the the equipment that you know basically try to automate all of this but uh, are there any um uh special things to look out for for with, with choosing an electronic filter wheel um so yeah so you, you said there uh, there's a couple different types you can get a manual uh type filter wheel there's a couple different manufacturers um, um, maybe you should just mention for other people what a filter wheel is, because some <laughs> people might not know. Question, yeah. yeah, sure. So, um, so a filter wheel basically is a device that you screw your different filters in, and it would automatically change your filter um, using either software or you go out manually and just kind of change it with the with your thumb, basically, um, to whatever filter you want to shoot through at the time, right? Um, so the only experience Chris I got, is showing Chris one. Is showing there you go, Chris got one. There you go. That answers everything. <laughs> no, no, I actually didn't actually bring this as a prop to sort of uh, sabotage your talk, Jim. I just had it. No, in no, no room. worries. If, if I was at home, I would have done the same thing. But there you go. But uh, I can only speak to the ZWO brand, uh, Jim. Um, so I guess uh, there's a couple of things you want to. Be cognizant of there is the one is the the filter size. So I've only got experience with one and a quarter inch filters, but one thing you want to be careful with there is that the uh, the one and a quarter inch filters are probably um, with regards to sensor size on your camera. Um, I think one and a quarter you're you're kind of at the limit of uh, um, like a four thirds type sensor with that one. Anything bigger than a four thirds, you're going to need a bigger uh, size filter, or you're going to get vignetting um, on the outer images of your, or on the on the outside of your image um, when you're capturing. Um, and again, obviously, the bigger the filter, the more expensive uh, it's going to get. Um, thickness is another thing you need to be cognizant of. Um, some of the filter rows are only so thick. Uh, that's uh, that really expensive Astrodon filter that I have. Is you'll be surprised how much thicker it is compared to um, the, some of the cheaper filters that I had. And it just barely fits within that filter wheel. So you got to be careful of your tolerance or your tolerances there as well. Um, other than that, that's about, that's the two biggest things I would think of uh, as a sensor size and just make sure the filters actually fit. Um, and of course, then there's different sizes. I know ZWO has a five 
position filter wheel. They have an eight. Um, I think some of their bigger filter wheels for uh, six or 36 millimeter or two inch filters are seven um, position. So yeah. And then of course you need to worry about back focus. Um, you need to take the thickness of the filter wheel into account when you're when you're working on your back focus. Okay, so we've got a question online um, from John. Do you do you use the same amount of exposure time on each filter each time, or does it vary by target? Um, generally, for narrowband, I usually uh, it depends on the filter I'm using. Again, if I'm using an Astrodon, um, I find that I need to go a lot longer. So I usually shoot five minutes with that. Um, with my astronomic filters, I usually shoot about three minutes. But for, for the different for the different colors, do you use the same time on for for HA O three yeah. and S two? Yeah, I use like three minutes generally across the board. Okay, um, I've got a naive question uh, for the you were talking about using or that there are narrowband filters for one shot color cameras yep. and i and you also told us and and we we know that the one shot color cameras have this um bayer layer where there are two greens for every red and blue mm -hmm. um do the um uh, do the narrowband filters for the one shot colors take into account the fact that you're getting uh, presumably more green than red and blue, or does that get taken care of somewhere else in the processing or does that never get taken care of? Um, I really don't know how to answer that question to be honest, because I've, I've, I've never used a one shot or a, a narrow band filter with a, a, a one shot color camera. But yeah, I would I imagine- Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, it's just it's just the light that gets through the filter to the camera. Yeah. So if 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 uh, all if the object is producing nothing but oxygen three light, your oxygen three filter will pass all the light from that object to the sensor. Um, but whether it's there or not, uh, the bare fil uh, sen filtered sensor, uh, the green pixels will see it, and the red and blue pixels won't, whether there's a filter there or not. Um, so that you know the filter can't rearrange how the sensor is being used. It'll just send allow light to the sensor. So if, if uh, all the red and blue light is blocked by the sensor sensor's bare map, you know uh, green filters uh, are not going to change uh, magically make the red and blue sensor sensitive. Yeah. So I so I guess maybe it's a question about how cameras work, and maybe Jim's getting ready to, to answer. Uh, um, I, I find that, that because there's double the number of green pixels, you're going to get double the amount of green. So you, so your 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 stacked image tends to be have a very green cast. So the big the big problem is in post processing is to do your color calibration. So basically, it's like uh, setting your white balance for a, a DS, DSLR. So you have to do the same thing with your raw data after you've uh, with one shot color. <laughs> you've got to find a way to transform that greenish picture into something that looks more natural, and you can do that in multiple ways. But uh, that's the that's the difficulty of, uh, of calibrating the color. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I guess I guess too that that kind of like reinforces the advantage of using a mono uh, sensor versus a a one-shot color sensor where you're utilizing all the pixels on the sensor um, irrelevant of um, you know what type of light is coming through your filter because uh, you're not getting that extra filtering with the, with the Bayer. It, it's uh, funny I've got both one-shot color uh, cameras and a dual band filter for, for one of them and a monochrome camera and this filter wheel which I just showed and yeah, uh, you have to expose more filters, um, so there's more time overall. But because when you're shooting blue and red, every single pixel in the uh, in the sensor is still seeing blue and red. With the with the one shot color, uh, only one quarter of the pixels are seeing red. Only one quarter yep. are seeing blue. 
So you have to shoot longer to get the red and blue signal strong enough, even with a one-shot color, unless you don't mind a, a noise in the red and blue channels. Um, because your green will be fine. Your green is twice as sensitive. But even then, that's a, a factor of two more green with a monochrome. So it's a, it depends very much on what it is you're shooting, whether it's one-shot color or, or narrow band. Certainly, narrow band allows you to do the magic that Jimmy are talking about, um, shooting from you know downtown Toronto with Astrodon filters. You can make it look like you're out in you know Kid Peak Observatory or something. You can't do that with a one-shot color. Okay, um, we can have a couple more questions. Maybe go ahead, you first. I want to extend uh, Robert Babs' uh, question about the shooting galaxies, uh, because you can't use narrowband filters. Uh, I was wondering if anybody, uh, I know that polarizers can be used for reducing the sky glow if you uh, rotate the polarizer. Is it, have you ever used one of those? Say, if, if you have a street like my, my house has a street light over on one side, and I found that if I turn the polarizer, I could reduce the glow from the light. So I wonder if has anybody tried that uh, with galaxies to see if it makes a difference in the contrast. Mm -hmm. First, I've heard of it, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, pretty good suggestion, um, but no answer yet. But uh, Robert, you had a question? Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, <clears throat> if the manufacturer of these chips to make an RGGB or uh, two two greens, or you know, red and blue, one red, one blue. If that's uh, a leave over of terrestrial photography, and you know, maybe we don't for ast for astrophotography, maybe we don't need two greens. Maybe it'd be better if there was one green, one red, one blue. I don't know. And I don't know if anybody can answer. Well. I think I, I'm just guessing now, but I think it has something to do with the with the levels that um, are best for black and white. So when you actually convert a, a color picture to black and white, you usually weight the green twice as much or something yeah. in the other in the other channel to get a natural luminance. So yeah, and it's good. it's probably also got to do with the sensitivity of your eye. Yeah, the, the natural part, I think, is, is what yeah. Jim was saying just then. So, yeah, I've, I, I've, the inverse, I, I just mentioned this briefly. Yeah, um, red, the, the, yeah, four pixels are square, and two by two is four, right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, is, that's a limitation. However, I, I also play with virtual reality headsets, and, and they're the, that's a reverse problem. That's a television. And they've always grouped these uh, pixels in slightly different. I've recently seen that they're grouping them in bands, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, red blue, green, to answer your question, Robert. So I think somebody's thinking about more even equality amongst the color bands, shall we say. Okay. Well, with, with that, maybe we can uh, thank Jim again for, uh, for a heroic effort, uh, considering he's been up since four in the morning almost and had a, had a pretty long day already. So that was a great talk. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Very informative and uh, lots of interest. And we're glad you never got a call to go to work. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> and uh, David and Richard, I, I admitted you, I hope you weren't waiting too long uh, for me to notice that you were trying to get in. Um, not very long. Okay. So I'm going to. Um, no, it wasn't long. Okay, good. I'm going to go through. Um, the observations uh let's see if i can get things working here so um and uh there we go so jim took this one of a sun pillar over tv i'm gonna go through the observation we're, we're trying to wrap up fairly early because of the potential snow so i'm not going to be looking for a lot of uh commentary but uh you get this when you get uh, ice crystals and uh, and light blue. Well, I, this isn't light blue because it's the sun, so that's okay, I guess. And uh, John uh, had a few pictures. This was one of the uh, monkey head nebula, and uh, 
I think you did a couple different ways of processing, and I think I caught the later one here. Um, very nice. Um, and the Leo triplet, so it's getting to be that time of year. Um, not in my backyard yet, but that's nice to see coming. That feels like summer. Um, again, lovely picture. And then uh, we had a, just one or two pictures of Jupiter and Venus in the last week or so. So I'm going to go through them fairly quickly because they're all fairly similar until the last one, which is quite interesting. So this is one that I took at the Aquarina early, so February 19th. You see Jupiter and Venus. Um, uh, Cynthia did one on February 23rd. The moon was there. So there's uh, Venus and Jupiter. Gary did one with his cell phone. Um, Venus is hiding next to a telephone pole. And Sue Hart had one here. And there's Jupiter. And there's Venus. And uh, Randy did one the same night. And I did one with uh, a DSLR the same night. And then this, um, I tried some doing different nights, but we'll see a better effort at that later on. So February 24th, February 26th, and February 27th, as they're getting closer together, um, 24th and 27th were from the same place. The 26th there is at the Aquarina. Um, Jim did one on the 27th, and you can see the moons around Jupiter. So that's, I've blown that up there to see them. That's pretty impressive. Nice work. Um, and Randy did one using the provincial infrastructure, which is pretty cool. Um, actually, their camera works pretty well. That's a pretty good shot. Um, and then March 1st was the day when they were uh, closest together. So there's a shot from me, one from Randy, one from Jim Stacy from Signal Hill. Um, Sue Hart, there they are up there above a, uh, a telephone pole. And Gary Diamond got one through a telescope, and you can see moons really well there. Very nice. And uh, Chris got one with lots of moons through a, a telephone lens on a Canon SL3. Um, and this, I guess, is same camera setup. And um, later on, when it was, um, I guess, getting a little bit later because it's a bit darker. Um, and Bernard also got one through a security camera. So he wasn't, I guess it was uh, hard to get to his observatory, but his security camera picked it up and some moose tracks. So he's the only one that's got moose tracks, so there. Um, then uh, Jim also has a shot here where you can see the, uh, if you blow it up, you can see the bands on Jupiter. So that's pretty cool having um, the bands on Jupiter along with Venus, if you look closely enough. Um, and then the pedals got some very, as always, some very interesting shots. So uh, the conjunction with an airplane nearby, um, shot with some clouds. Again, you can see some, some moons in that one uh, and some other shots here. So with very nice background. Uh, and then this is moving past March 1st. So um, this is Robert with a cell phone, me with a cell phone. Uh, so now Jupiter is below Venus. And Gary, this is March 4th. So Jupiter is farther below Venus. So there's Gary with a cell phone. And I blew, or maybe Gary blew that up a little bit. And then this one is the one I was alluding to at the beginning. So Randy put these all together and um, there aren't dates there, but you can see uh, Jupiter, um, well, actually it's sort of Venus coming up and passing Jupiter. Um, and that's really nicely illustrated. So Randy, that's, that's really nice. Thank you very much. Um, and there were a few other things that people saw. Um, I did some things I'd look at the double cluster and the moon, that was the same night um, that I started looking at uh, 
Venus and Jupiter. Jim Stacy did a, a lovely, very crisp shot of the moon on March 1st. So that was the night of the conjunction. Um, so lots of detail in that. And Jim got a new camera. So yay, Jim. Yep, yep. And uh, so he, these are, so this is the camera with many, many bits in between the camera and the lens to make it all work. Um, described what's that? Lots of spacers, lots of spacers. It's described on the uh RSC NL talk, and that's his 500 millimeter uh lens and fiddling around with the back focus on two different nights. Um, this M101 up near uh the handle of the Big Dipper, and John Nugent uh with uh a new piece of equipment too, and an Optolong L Enhance. And this is his jellyfish, and you, um, John, posted this twice, and the second one was, uh, um, I guess you uh, processed it differently to get uh, rid of the stars a little bit. Um, sometimes that bar goes away, and sometimes it doesn't. There we go. Okay. And Gary, I'm, I am going to let Gary explain this one. Uh, so th this is your meteor camera, and. Um, these are the same, are these two meteors? Yeah, they're two meteors. Uh, uh, Randy had uh, left a message on the, uh, on the list that, uh, and uh, a video of someone out in Upper Valley. Yeah. Uh, video, uh, their, their phone camera or their doorbell camera had picked up two meteors, one coming and the other one coming just a little bit after. And he asked, uh, he said it was around five. So these are universal times here which correspond to that time when my camera points over towards upper valleys and I seem to have picked them up as they're coming in. So are, they, are these two pieces of the same meteor probably or? Uh, don't know, probably from the same uh, meteor tower or okay. meteor sector, but they were two separate meteors. Kind of interesting. But it's just those three frames in the top that it caught yeah. it, right? Yeah. yeah, those are three frames on the top of that. Okay. Very nice. And uh, Robert uh, has been, trying to master remote imaging so he can stay inside and mm -hmm, yeah. never go never go outside again and so i guess this was a sign of progress yeah. m37 on march 5th taken from inside take it from inside <laughs> and gary had a uh, lovely shot of the sun here and you were complaining when you posted this about the bay or something right yeah i was getting all this you can still see the squares. Yeah. Fair shape. Uh, there's also right up on top uh, a clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had sent it as a tip and it was good, but nobody could get it as a tip. So I made it a peg and I made the uh, clear small, uh, darker. Okay. So I'm having a lot of trouble with the thing. And I found out that when I took that, the green filter that I replaced uh, thing comes loose and that came halfway down when I took that picture. Oh, okay. And Jim, so was this, yeah, so this was another M101 with your new camera? Yeah, a, these are all test shots with different uh, different numbers of spacers. And oh, okay. So you're trying to focus. Same with focus and just trying to get the focus to work. Don't buy any organic focus. Uh-huh. Okay, so. Um, it is a. It is a. Okay, so what's our thinking? There's still no snow, right? Well, maybe it was a wizard. Maybe it's water. So um, the, uh, the sky this month, uh, let's see if I can. So, Robert, did you want to go through or should we just tell people that this is posted? And uh, so th I think this is your sky this month now. Yeah, we're not seeing that. You're not seeing it? No, not on the other one? Oh, because I'm not sharing. not sharing the right screen. Okay. It's so complicated. <laughs> 
Okay, so Robert, you're called. Do you, do you want to go through this, or should we just tell people it's posted? Or? Just tell people it's posted. Yep. So the usual stuff. Yeah. Nothing going on in the sun. Um, and so this is posted on the website, and uh, we'll just um, I'll just draw it to your attention. It exists. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, for preparing it. And uh, I think if I'll invite any questions, and if not, um, I'll just remind you that uh, our next meeting is going to be Wednesday, April 19th. And as I was say saying at the beginning, it's going to be, is that showing up on the, okay. It's going to be Dr. Ivan Booth from the math department talking about why galaxies that are beyond a certain threshold as you go farther away they look bigger it's got to do with the expansion of the universe and relativity stuff and uh it should be very interesting so any questions if not i'll thank everybody for being here and uh we had weather last month's meeting weather was threatened for this month's meeting and it affected it, but it's not here yet. You know, say goodbye to everybody then. Goodbye, folks. Um, I guess we do have, not for you at home, but for the people who are brave enough to come, there are some donuts and cookies, and Randy brought in a pot of coffee. So we'll have a short social time and, uh, yeah, and uh, I'll just, I can, uh, if anybody wants to talk, you can uh, unmute yourself and yell and we'll hear you. And if not, we'll see you in a month. Thanks, Jim. And thanks, thanks again, Jim. You're welcome. That. How many there's people one, there? two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's eight in person, and I think we're up to about 15 or 16 online. Thank you. I can't believe I screwed up the. Uh, 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 just a second. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we have the advantage. Like, we're separate.